This week on Back of the Grid, we're going to be discussing if McLaren and Mercedes let Red Bull off the hook. We're going to be looking at why Hamilton and Leclerc got disqualified and all the other stories from Austin, as well as a look ahead to the Mexican Grand Prix. Hello everyone and welcome to Back of the Grid. Uh, I'm Chris, I'm joined as ever by Tom. Hello. And by Stu. Hi. We are here to discuss the United States Grand Prix. Is that That's what correct. this one's called? That's what it's yeah. called. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Despite the fact there's three... So there, everyone's is... amusement yeah. is the United States Grand Prix. <laughs> um, there's a lot to cover this week, so I think we'll just sort of dive straight into it. We can, um, but first, if you are enjoying watching us or if you're new to the show please do hit that subscribe button yes please do um so yeah we'll start off with the big question i suppose did mclaren and or mercedes massively let red bull off the hook here yes <laughs> massively. cool thanks for I listening mean, what, everyone <laughs> one of them got disqualified so <laughs> well yeah um i guess we'll start with mclaren because i think they're maybe the lesser of the two um Mm-hmm. So everyone started on mediums. Norris took the lead. He sort of pulled a bit of a gap at the start, and then that gap kind of waned as the first stint went on. Um, Verstappen was first to pit for a second set of mediums, so we knew straight away they were locked into a two-stopper. Yeah. Um, they would have to finish the race on hards. Mm-hmm. Norris pitted a lap later, but he went on to the hards of his middle stint, which, in theory, gave McLaren the option of doing medium, hard, medium, giving Norris a tire advantage at the end. The or a one did, stop. Or even a one stop. Well, probably a bit early for a one stop, but potential. Um, Verstappen did catch and pass Norris for the lead on lap 28, which was kind of to be expected. Um, then Norris pitted again on lap 35, so he'd only done 18 laps on that set of hards to put on another set of hards. Um, Verstappen obviously responded, also went on to hards, so the tire advantage was gone. Um the gap ebbed and flowed a little bit, but ultimately Norris kind of faded. He didn't nearly have the pace and he ended up 10 seconds behind Verstappen. Um, mm-hmm. Do you think there's a version of events where Norris actually could have beaten Verstappen in that race? Um, Maybe if he'd managed to extend the first stint a little bit longer, but I think the deck was just too high. Like... It it shows that the car's improved as as it has been. Like we were worried it wasn't gonna work as well here because of the bumpiness. But I think the Red Bull is just so much kinder on its tires. It was easier yeah. for it was easier for them to get more out of them. Um, and I think that showed just by the way that Norris sort of managed to maintain a, a gap to some degree. But it was kind of always just just falling away from him. And you've got to remember, like Verstappen was holding on to his brakes essentially like he had trouble throughout most of that race in that regard so brake issues he didn't really mention that so (laughs) like i think that that negated the difference in tire performance because of the difficulties he was having there and had Mm. it not been for that it would have probably just been a normal race for red bull in that regard Mm, i'm not 100 percent sure about that i think there's a reason uh, you know these things are quite dynamic and mm. the Red Bull doesn't usually have this level of competition pushing it along. And it's not often mm-hmm. we've seen the Red Bull being pushed this hard throughout the entirety of a race. But so, on the flip side, the Red Bull ran at the correct ride height. So well, I was going <laughs> to well, say, true, but I mean, well, I, well, I don't know. Like, let's let's hang fire on that one. Yeah, but, we'll, um, we'll get there. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that's as as, cut and, as simple as that. But um <clears throat> Ah, you've thrown me off now. I think the... <laughs> yeah, they haven't been pushed that hard. So, And when you're getting pushed that hard, you're obviously going to be pushing your brakes much, much harder. Yeah. So it could be a new um, feature of the Red Bull that they've not discovered yet, simply thanks to the fact that they have never had to push so hard over the course of a race. It's possible, um, yeah. I think Norris, yeah, the, look, the, no, there wasn't really much running on the hard... Well, if, if any running on the hard tyre during free practice one no. from what i saw um yeah. and obviously no one used it in the sprint race because why would you um yeah so 
no one really had the data that they needed to to know what that tile was going to do. And the expectation was obviously that it would last, I think, a lot longer than it did. And then it just suddenly seemed to drop off quite quickly as well. I think we saw that at the end of the race on Verstappen, his his, yeah. his hard tyres yeah. just fell off a cliff. Um, Hamilton's did mid-race and Norris's did mid-race as well. So, And that was because probably Norris pushed a little bit too hard on those tyres during that stint, They, mm. w- which led to that earlier pit stop than maybe he would have liked. But at that at that time... No one really knew what they were going to do. It could, it look, no one knew if they were going to go, be able to go all the way to the end or if they were going to you know, fall apart after a few laps or what. So it was a really, it was an exciting race because it was. In, in those moments, you kind of like, you just don't know who's going to win. Like you, especially where Verstappen is on the track, where, where uh, Hamilton was on the track, where Norris was on the track. Any of those, at the, like mid-race, any of those three cars could have won the race, I think. Those three lead. Oh, definitely. Yeah, I, I think a chance. I think there's an element of what you were saying there into why Red Bull went medium, medium, and left the hard till the end is because they wanted to get as far as they could and make up as much ground as they could with a tire that they understood before yeah. moving to the hard. I've not had a chance to check Norris's situation, but I'm not. I could be wrong, but the potential of them going hard, hard was because. He didn't have the right allocation with, from the rest of the weekend. I don't well, know. This is the next thing I was going to say is that, in a way, McLaren kind of ruined their chances on Friday because in mm. free practice one, McLaren only ran the medium tyre on both yeah. cars through the whole of practice. Then they ran the sprint race on the mediums. So come the race, Norris literally had that one set of fresh mediums, which he started the race on. Yeah. That, that was all he had left. So his only options in the race really were hards or switch to use mediums which yeah. were quick but they fell off way too soon yeah. so 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 back to tom's point um verstappen running two mediums one after the other i think that was the sensible option not only because of all the reasons you said but also because you're going to be planning on doing a lot of overtaking and you want a lot of <clears> grip <throat> in order to mm-hmm. allow that yeah you, know, you want to be breaking late. You want to be. You want to speed through the corners. You want good exits if you're going to be doing overtaking, right? Well, you. I mean, you want all these things anyway, but you especially <laughs> want them if you're going to be overtaking. Yeah. If you've got cars ahead, slower cars ahead of you to overtake, you want to make your life as easy as possible. So that I think was the logical strategy for Verstappen. I think he was always going to run that strategy regardless of what what anyone else did on hard, softs, mediums, whatever. Like that was the ideal strategy for that particular race. Um, yeah sorry Norris Chris what were you saying Um, yeah that was it really just that I think their tyre choices throughout the weekend were oh they ran out of tyres yeah yeah Yeah. they'll they'll definitely look back and maybe review that because yeah so the medium is always going to be the sprint race tyre and always going to be one of the race tyres so it's a rinse through them obviously you've only got one practice session so you want as much data on the tyre you're going to be spending the most time on as you can but that data is no good if you've then rinsed through all of the tires and yeah, you can't yeah. use it anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think like there's an issue here because obviously it's, it's starting to look like not just for McLaren, but I feel like every every sprint race we've had a conversation at some point about someone running out of tires across mm. a race weekend, and it seems like the who knew? It seems like they're not <laughs> quite set up tire wise to and logistically to to run these sprint race race weekends as effectively as maybe they might. So I don't think it's right that it can be the case that a team runs out of tyres and can't run an optimum race strategy on a Grand Prix. I feel like that's there's something wrong with that for me. I want all the cars to be on their, you know, ha- have an equal chance and be on the best possible strategy of their choosing and not be limited by something as arbitrary as how many tyres you got left, you know? Like, I, yeah, because with just this, seems current, wrong to me. this current sprint format, they're doing more competitive running with less tyres than a normal weekend, which just seems yeah. completely backwards. It's, it's mental. It's bizarre. Absolutely mental. Of course, they're going to, like, smash through tyres because, yeah, I, 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 in a way, I understand, like, and in a way, like, it is on the teams to make sure they use up their allocation responsibly and not, go over the top early doors with the wrong tyre set or gathering too much data on a particular set of tyre, using up too many. But at the same time, like, 
I feel like every sprint race we've had this season, it feels like it's been a theme. Like someone has has run out of tires, mm. and it affects the racing. You know, it stops. It makes the Grand Prix itself less enjoyable because it's 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 stopping people from being able to compete, and yep. that's not really what 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 Formula One should be about. It shouldn't be. You know, <laughs> <laughs> oh, we don't have enough tires, we can't compete. That's that's strange. That's absurd. That's not not. It's not why I'm watching Formula One. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Should we move on to Mercedes? Let's. Yeah. So they say they were planning to to stop Hamilton from the start. But during the first stint, it was they were sort of starting to think, actually, maybe we can stretch this to a one-stopper. So they switched strategy kind of midway through the first stint. Um, Norris and Verstappen pitted. And then three laps later, the <laughs> Hamilton's lap time has plummeted and they bailed out. Yeah. Um, huh. In the space of that three laps, Hamilton lost several seconds to... He- he, Verstappen was about six seconds behind Hamilton. Sorry, no, he's about four seconds behind Hamilton when Verstappen pitted. Mm-hmm. And he gained, I think, six on him and overtook him by about two or three seconds yeah. by the time Hamilton had pitted. So the undercut over three laps was worth, yeah. what, six, seven seconds? Yeah. Um, he had ran, Hamilton ran hard to the middle stint. Then um, he went back to mediums a few laps after Norris and Verstappen put on hard. So he did have the tyre advantage at the end, which paid off for him. I mean, it kind of, to go back to what we were saying about McLaren's tyre choices, the medium, hard, medium definitely worked for Hamilton. He would manage to chase down that gap pretty rapidly. Um, took Norris for second pretty easily. Probably needed like another couple of laps for Verstappen, would you say? Probably, it was two, probably a lap. Yeah. Maybe even one. It was 2.2 in the end. The rate he was catching him on the last two laps, he went from being, for a long time, roughly rap- lapping around four tenths slower to then, as Verstappen's, obviously, brakes start to get really cooked and tyres start to go as well at the same time, then, yeah, it was, we're talking sort of eight, nine tenths to a second. So yeah. it was really, really good. I think it was one point... Uh, the closest he got was about 1.2, 1.4 seconds. So I think one more yeah. lap, he would have caught him and got him. Yeah. Um, I mean, oh, so yeah, like strategically, you've got to say they got that wrong. Had they stuck to their original two-stop plan from the start and not tried to switch mid-race, yeah, probably Hamilton probably would have won that, I think. Yeah, There's I mean, it costs a lot of time. Play, yeah. There's the slow pit stops as well. I mean... Do it, take a second off each of those pit stops and it's suddenly closed the gap, hasn't it? Like, Yeah, that was the next point I wanted mm. to make. Like, Mercedes pit stops have not been great for a while now, but like Hamilton's were, I think, was it 3.4 and a 3.6 second pit stop? Yeah, something like that. They're in the three like, seconds, both of them. Hamilton's so best two pit stop. Uh, yeah, Hamilton's yeah. best pit stop of the race was the 21st fastest of the race. And, like, when you're fighting a car like the Red Bull that's that dominant, you just can't be affording to give away two seconds like that in the pit stop. Mm. Yeah. Well, especially um, when it's this close as well. Like, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, really, really close. Um, I think yeah, there Mercedes were a, in their domination years, I think they got sort of into the habit of prioritising um, – just getting everything right over speed in their pit stops because they could afford to. But I did like these days with things being closer, I just don't think you can. They've gone too far in the being safe direction, I think. Mm. Yeah, they don't. Well, they, you need a you need a good margin, I think, to to be able to do that. I think, yeah, these days in Formula One, especially with with things tightening up the way they seem to be at the moment, then yeah, every little counts, doesn't it? Absolutely every factor has to be one hundred percent perfect if you're gonna if you're gonna beat the best. And it's always it's always been that way, but um definitely when you've got sort of when you've got the performance margin that Mercedes ha- did enjoy for a long period of time, then yeah, there's an argument to say that they did maybe focus less on the on the pit stops and the and the pit crew getting their job done as effectively and fast as possible and more on the pace in the car, which part of me is like, I'd rather that, but part of me, another part of me is like formula one as a whole pit stops are a huge part of it. And they're one of the most exciting parts of any race. And one of the biggest spectacles in formula one is seeing that, you know, sub two second pit stop is 
is a sight to behold, isn't it? It's a really, really mm. special thing to see. Um, I, mean, I remember when Red Bull got the fastest ever, um, that, well, which isn't the fastest ever anymore, but at the time was the fastest mm. ever, the 1.8 something, which has since been beaten by McLaren with another 1.8, slightly less. And that car was off the ground before it even stopped the Red Bull. Yeah. Yeah. Like it was literally, it sort of skate, it, it comes to a stop as it's being lifted and it sort of almost skates to a stop on the jacks. Like just by like literally maybe 10 centimeters, like a really, really mm. short distance. But that's how on it they were. That's how yes. in sync they were with how quickly they could do it and how everything was just completely spot on on that particular pit stop. And they got it back down on the ground almost before you could blink and it was away. It was just absolutely, it was, what's the word? It was like a dance. It was like a perfect <laughs> poetry in motion. Poetry yeah. emotion. There you go. That's what I'm looking for. Thank you, Chris. Um, <laughs> yeah, and it is. You know, so it is a is a really really special part of Formula One. I think that teams are able to to complete pit stops, full service, four tires, in such a short period of time. Like when you say it out loud, like it almost doesn't seem real. Yes. If you were to, if you yeah. told someone who's never seen a motor race before, who didn't really care about cars or knew could drive but knew enough about cars that it takes quite a while to change a tire, that they were doing them in that amount of time in Formula One. They wouldn't believe you. People wouldn't believe no. you that you could do that. Like it's a, it's a stupidly small number, and but it's it's such a stupidly small number. But we talk we are, we you know we're talking about a second less than a second difference in a pit stop, potentially like deciding a race result as well. Like yes. yeah. so this is it. Just how tight these margins are. Yeah. So there's that. I think like the the other thing was obviously Hamilton's pace on track on that hard tire was by the time he came in was obviously quite severely degraded. So he there was a big compromise there. He, like I said, he's lost six seconds to Verstappen there. So yeah. let's add these up. That's six seconds. Being generous, he's lost six seconds on the wrong tire. Then he's lost another two seconds during the pit, the pit stops. That's eight seconds. So in theory. Just with those two things alone, Hamilton could have finished the race four or five seconds ahead of Max Verstappen if those yeah. things had gone right, if they'd got that pit call right. Um, you don't know what's going to happen to Hamilton's tyres towards the end, of course. Like, it could have been a much finer gap than that because the medium tyre would have gone off a little bit sooner towards the end, but at, still... At the very least, it gets him in range to have a few goes at passing Max. Yeah, and yeah. in the end, what actually happened was he, he didn't catch him in time to even have a go. Yeah. And that's the difference. That's, you know, those fine margins, four laps too long on the wrong tyre and two slow pit stops. And it, it's unequivocally, it's cost him the race. Not that it is, I mean, it's academic because he was disqualified. People yeah. are screaming at their, like, in down their audio in the yeah. heavens or uh, it's on YouTube now because it obviously he got disqualified. But I think it's good to talk about it. We'll talk about the disqualifications in a minute. I think it's good to talk about this as though no one's been disqualified for now and then yeah. we'll get into the disqualifications and later it's, on. It's especially interesting in the context that Mercedes brought a big upgrade to this race, which, yeah. I mean, Hamilton has said over the weekend that basically, like, he can suddenly feel the rear of the car again. Like, this new floor is giving him the feedback he's been missing for a couple of seasons now, I guess, with this kind of evolution of car. So, yeah, it definitely feels... Well, again, before we get to the disqualifications, it feels like this upgrade has gone in the right direction. Yeah. I mean, um, to, be, to be fair, that... The, the upgrade and that, uh, I would say, unrelated. The the upgrade and the disqualification, like the upgrade, the disqualification is related to the ride height being too low. It's like the, the upgrade has not caused it by proxy, I don't think. Because Ferrari got disqualified for exactly the same thing and didn't have an upgrade. So yeah. I think they're, the, they're unrelated to one another. The, yeah, the, the to question a point, it leads up to... Up to a point, to, they are, up yeah. to a point. I think the question it leads to is will the upgrade work as well as they yeah. think it will at a legal level? Yeah, yeah. that's, I mean, there, that's there, the there difference. Was, was or is it just this track? Hold on, um, hold on, hold on. There was nothing illegal about their ride height. It was the... It's obvious the bumps caught a lot of people out. And I think if we're going to get into... Let's just do... Let's quickly do Max's records and then we'll do... We'll quickly mention Max. He won. It's his 50th win in F1. Um, pretty uh, small companies in there. Uh, equals his own record of 15 wins in a single season, which he set, which he set last year. So that is a new record. It's going to get smashed probably in about, what, six days' time at the point we're yeah. recording this. Listen um, 
Very quick word on the first time he passed Leclerc um, yeah. in the first stint. Mm, yeah. Do should you think Stonewall should have given it back? Yeah, I think it was. An absolute dive bomb. The is this the one where he ended up going off around the outside, or is it the one where he pushed no, Leclerc it was, off? It was down the two inside pushing Leclerc. Ones. He pushed Leclerc wide. Yeah. well. Leclerc kind of outbreaks himself a little bit as well, which is why they didn't get involved. I think yeah. in the FIA. But I think if Leclerc had not braked as late as he had and and had sort of stuck close and and been able to complain that he'd been pushed wide, then I think it would have been different. But I suppose. He doesn't have to give the place back if Leclerc outbreaks himself, and I think he got. A li- Let's put it this way: I think the yeah. Stappen got lucky that that Leclerc had outbreaked himself. If he hadn't, he would have had to give that place back. Yeah. Do you, Do you think he'd have pushed him wide if he'd not outbreaked himself? Though, do you think Leclerc would have been in the position to be pushed out wide? Maybe that's another Stappen. factor in it. But I think I, so yeah, I've, because I've Verstappen it- break. Sorry, Verstappen break so late that there was no way he was making that corner and leaving space on the outside for the car on the outside. So he would have. He would have had to have. We would have no. When he when he made the decision to break where he did, when he did, he at that point he knew that he was going. He, he yeah, he's making the apex first, but he's he's going so wide that the other car is not going to be able to stay around the outside. Therefore, he's pushed him wide. I've watched it back in slow mo, and, and at the apex, they're basically wheel to wheel, but Leclerc is still very slightly ahead at the apex. Um, Verstappen then just kind of just about keeps it on the circuit, just about keeps it on within the lines. And as you say, Leclerc just steams off because he break way too late. So, yeah, I I think it would be harsh to start saying you have to give places back when the person you're overtaking has outbreaked themselves and gone off the track. Um, yeah. I agree with you, Stuart. I think, I think that's why he's gotten, gotten away with it. Yeah, I think it is. More than yeah. anything. I think, I, right, I think should, we, should we talk disqualifications? Yeah. So Hamilton Leclerc disqualified after the post-race scrutineering um, for excessively worn planks. I believe it was at the back of the plank on both cars, um, which kind of goes to what we were saying about it probably being to do them um, riding the bumps. Both teams said that, like held the hands up and said, yeah, like it's a it's a slam dunk. We're not going to yeah. contest that. Um, they both pointed to the fact that it was a sprint weekend with very limited setup time as a factor in them getting the ride height wrong essentially also valid yeah Yeah, i think so um before we get into the kind of uh, the hows and whys of which cars were and weren't investigated which is interesting itself um to go back to what we sort of started talking about um like let's let's tackle it sort of (laughs) <clears throat> okay, so we we were talking about the upgrades and how let's let's go bit by bit. So first of all, M- Mercedes upgrades um, and ride height. Uh, there is an argument to say that the upgrade may not work as well at the next race if they're running at a slightly higher ride height. So you know the the ride height and the floor kind of work together hand in hand. And if you run your car higher, then your floor is going to produce less downforce because. It, there's less of a it, it, the diffuser's doing its job less efficiently because there's too much air getting able to get in. It's not able to suck itself down to the floor and make that um, uh, low pressure zone underneath. The, the prime car. example of that being Red Bull's worst two races this season on pace here in Singapore, probably yeah. the two bumpiest tracks on yeah. the calendar. Yeah, exactly. So when so in terms of like the competitive order and where Mercedes will be at the next race i think i probably think i think they probably will be still in the mix i don't think this is enough of a sort of uh enough of a factor to 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 disqualify the the floor like yeah and when i say disqualify i mean to you know to to say the the floor hasn't done its job the upgrade hasn't done its job because the upgrade has certainly done its job i think with the old floor they won't have been anywhere near i think i think they've been caught out because running a new floor this you know they've not had enough time to 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 get to know the ride height they need to run that floor at, at this no. particular track i think that's a huge factor for all the teams and i think a lot of the teams probably had 
illegal flaws by the end of the race. I think there's no doubt about that. I think when when half of the test bed have uh, should we should we get into illegal, that then? Yeah, let's get into that. I've, I've grabbed a couple of things from the inbox early because they cover this, which we're going to cover anyway. Um, so Sarah said, uh, FYI use sample testing, i.e. not all the cars are checked every race. And while I think that's a pretty good solution normally, is there not an argument that if 50% of the sample cars fail, yeah. then to check all cars? To which Absolutely. Darth Kilowog added, this should just be a permanently recurring question. Once again, this weekend's have caused us to wonder why the FYI doesn't <laughs> care about perceived legitimacy of its sport. Um, yeah. And it is, yeah. a, it is a weird one. Like, So there's... There's a, there's a few factors here. I think part of this comes down to sort of a little bit of confusion around the word random because they call it random testing, but it's not random in that they just pull some numbers out of a hat and that's the cars they test. It's random in the same way that like drug testing is random in that from the competitor's point of view, it can happen at any point in time, mm. but it doesn't mean that the people doing the tests are picking them at random. They're still choosing who to, to, yeah, to check. Yeah, to yeah, it's yeah, random yeah. to the, it's a, it's a random event, not like yes, it's, it's it, to a, the team it's, it's random because yeah, it's you could be, because it could happen at any point. In time. Yeah. And that's, yeah, so that's there are, so the situation to, to clarify that if I'm a steward and I can smell titanium burning on one of the cars at the end of the race, I'm going to think that car needs a check. I'm going to randomly which, check that car. Yeah, which sounds like yeah. that is legitimately a yeah, thing they look it. out for. Yeah, um, yeah, they also monitor the onboard videos for cars that sort of look like they're bottoming out or bouncing. Particularly, um, there's vertical oscillation sensors on the cars they monitor as well. Yeah. So it's not random, random. Um, yeah. they're, they're under. They're, they're all being watched the whole time to see if they need yeah. to be checked, and yeah. then they'll put the, the ones that they determine need to be checked. They'll put them into the hat of, of cars that that they do check. So for reference, um, after Japan, no flaws were checked. Um, they checked one after the Qatar sprint, three after the Qatar Grand Prix, none after this sprint, four after this. So it's 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 at their disc- discretion, basically. I think it's quite weird that um, for some reason before and during the race, Martin Brundle was talking a lot about Joe Bauer, who is the FIA technical delegate, and about the service he's given and how good he is at his job. And then all of a sudden post-race, he becomes <laughs> very important to the result of this race changing. Um, so yeah, the next weird thing is the fact that Sainz and Russell's cars weren't checked. You would yeah. think mm-hmm. if, because the, the, the cars that were checked were Hamilton, Leclerc, Norris and Verstappen. You would think at the very least, you would check the teammates of the two cars that failed yeah. their test Your probably thoughts, yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and again sort of back to what you're saying before Stu like they did a sample size of four 50 percent failed which means there's 13 other finishers may have also been illegal yeah, might not 50, who knows 50 percent of the total finishers yeah yeah and not only did some of those score points some of them benefited from other people being disqualified which is, that's yeah. it this is the thing yeah like, so, like, yeah, your car might be illegal, but it's never been checked and you've just gained some places. <laughs> and you've got yeah. the same issue that the car that's been caught out has got. Like, you know, it's not a foolproof method, this random, uh, this random no, definitely selection not. method, is it? Um, and then, of course, another factor is that everyone's got to be in Mexico in a few days' time. Like, yeah. Joe Bell goes around and chooses which cars he's going to um, uh, scrutinise and then all the rest are suddenly dismantled and packed away because they're like right up against it in the middle of a triple header, yeah. um, which again, not ideal. Um, yeah. So so there's there's some issues here that we're, we're identifying that, that are sort of beginning to surface, aren't there? Um, the first one is like the FIA are clearly not equipped to to scrutinize the 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 competitors effectively that's that's what it appears yep. to yeah. be from where i'm sitting you know you, you would expect really much more diligence across across the team, across the field of 20 cars you'd expect them to be able to pick out more than a couple to do at each race and you'd at least expect there to be some contingency that if you did find an issue on more than 50% of the people that you do test 
that you expand that across the well really you should be expanding it across the entire grid to work out who's who's finished fairly well, and who hasn't i mean hmm. should should the procedure in reality not be that the top 10 point scorers regardless should go through a set of basic hmm. scrutineering because ultimately if any of them fail that somebody else is going to be yeah of beneficiary and then in re- in reality that car should th- like yeah. it should be sort of a waterfall effect of like your your point scorers are initially scrutinized to these minimum levels like floor floor checks wing checks all that kind of generic stuff that more often than not if it's a failure you're disqualified rules and then yeah, well, yeah, but what what I mean is like there's certain things that come up more often than not for failure, yeah, like fuel failures, sample, guess, yeah, fuel well. samples, etc. Et so there's a there's a, a set test bed of of things to test that don't need like a, another team's protest and stuff like that. That's done against every single car of the top ten, and then if any of car uh, those cars get a penalty or an exclusion that causes them to fall out of that top ten whoever comes in and replaces them should then also be subjected yep. to the top test. Exactly the same as what's happened with people that have inherited points positions this weekend because of, and and by proxy maybe as well, like we say, the the teammates should be checked. But if you're doing the whole top 10 and then anyone else that inherits a position, you'd kind of cover off, you'd mitigate it that problem logical. anyway, realistically. Yeah. And I think <clears> a lot of it just comes down to time and personnel and a lack of yeah. both ultimately totally totally yeah. just under-resourced maybe that's why they've uh, upped the fine to a million pounds for <laughs> anyone who transgresses <laughs> yeah right on track that that's just outrageous isn't it it's to which alex disgusting. albon said I, I think alex albon um said i'm pretty sure about three drivers on the grid could actually afford that. yeah yeah which i'm not i'm sure it's a few more than that but it's definitely not all of them um <laughs> A line I did see somebody on the internet say, I can't remember where I saw this, and I'm not saying I necessarily agree with this, but it is kind of food for thought regarding the testing of cars, is that if two cars get disqualified, the teams look silly. If 10 cars get disqualified, the FIA the and F1 look silly. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that is true. Yeah, that is true, but... but- you know, in that case, then give them more chance to set their cars up properly. Well, <laughs> don't run yeah, these exactly. Silly sprint race weekends circle, where, where people don't have a whole, you know, people don't have the time to set up their cars, especially when they're bringing updates all the time and stuff. Like, there's an argument to say don't bring your updates during a sprint weekend as well. On the other hand, but I just think the yeah. whole, I mean, the sprint. Come on, let's be honest. The sprint race this weekend wasn't exactly. Well, I would say one of the worst. Dull. I mean. Happened. Y- You've only got to think of Indianapolis 2005 for the sport looking silly in general. Mm-hmm. So I mean, there's a I can think of more recent examples than that. Well, time, but, <laughs> but I'm, I'm, well, I'm just talking about like in terms of cars not being in the, in a race or whatever. Like, yeah. yeah, like we had six cars start a race, let alone <laughs> finish it. They didn't even, <laughs> and they didn't even all finish it, if I remember rightly, did they? Yeah. Well, let's so, let, I mean, let's let's not get bogged like, down in that one. We could do a whole episode about that. Yeah. Um, one more silly thing around all this that I've read as well is that I saw some questions around is there grounds for some teams to appeal the result based on the fact that there's a good chance some cars finish that race in a legal nope. way teams have a 30 minute window after the mm-hmm. checkered flag to protest a race result Joe Bauer's report on the floor checks came in two hours after the race finished so tough basically yeah yeah it's like you've got you've got half an hour to sort of clairvoyantly predict what might happen and then like yeah protest basically yeah absurd um, a bit silly. So final fi- the final thought on these dis- disqualifications. Do we think it will affect Mercedes' pace in the next race at the ribbon smooth um, Autodromo Hermanos Rodriguez? Rodriguez. I suspect that a normal weekend with three practice sessions will be enough for them to figure it out. My suspicion is that it won't be a problem, but it's not a guarantee. I think they'll be fine. I don't think it will make a difference. I think I think yeah. this is... It was literally on Leclerc's car. Mercedes, I don't think, have said how, how far off they were on their car, so maybe it was a bit more, but <laughs> on Leclerc's car, it was like 
tenths of a millimeter off. Yeah, it was, like, it was tiny. that much. It was a tiny, tiny, tiny. Because these things, you know, these skid plates, they're not made of like soft stuff. It's not an actual plank of wood. It's like this this sort of resin sort of stuff. It's not, it's, you know, people think of it as a as a plank of wood, but it, and it looks like a plank of wood because of the color of it. But it's actually like this really, really hard resin because they don't want it to wear away. Because if it wears away, obviously you get disqualified. Um, so yeah, it must have really been taking a lot of hammer for it to uh, to have worn away even a few tenths of a mil. But yeah. it, we are talking like marginal, marginal, marginal amounts here, and I think it is it is purely down to the bumps and probably two teams running their their cars at a ride height that maybe they're used, you know, that they would normally run it at, and they just haven't been able to factor in the amount of wear that they're going to get on these bumps at this yeah. particular circuit at this time, and it's the first time they've been caught out buy it red bull run their car a little bit lower i think but handle bumps a lot better but they mm. know that you know they've exp- they, they've got i think a bit more experience running their car at these ride heights so they therefore they know that yeah where yeah. they've got a better chance of like being able to tell when it's going to have more effect or not so they don't need as long to study their car to to set it up in that i mean regard. I think that's evident in the performance at the two circuits where it affects them the most, though, isn't it? Like, they've compromised yeah. the performance to ensure that they they stay within that boundary and they're not bottoming out as much. And it's clear that it's affected the performance because of how close people have got to them this weekend yeah. and how close people got to them in Singapore. Like, it is evident that it has an effect, but like you say, they, un- they understand it enough to know that we need to you know, move this far in this direction to be safe. Yeah. And so we've got enough in hand to still maintain and manage a race and probably come out with a win because we've got enough in hand over everybody else right now. Yeah. So but despite that's... all that, I think p- potentially they could be, they could eke out another gap again in Mercedes, uh, in, in, Mercedes, in Mexico, <laughs> because Mercedes, yes, Mercedes has got the new floor, but yeah, Red Bull... I think they've been flattered to deceive almost by Red Bull maybe running their car a little bit higher than they might I, have. I think and there's an element of that. A little bit lower possibly, I think. than they should have been. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think maybe mm-hmm. we might see Verstappen Perez, well, probably not Perez, but we'll see Verstappen um, with sort of back to the status quo, sort of race pace-wise, yeah. quite a big gap, I think. Yeah, I think so I too. would say so. Right, let's quickly just rattle through a few other teams before we move on to other things. Um, Ferrari managed the really impressive feat of starting on pole and then <laughs> literally within two corners becoming a footnote to the race. Um, Leclerc had a miserable time. Um, he was the only driver to actually want to stop the race. They stuck to their guns even though it was clearly failing, um, fell from pole to sixth on the road before he was ultimately we disqualified. We are checking... Yep. Um, Signs had an all right race. Um, kept his starting place of fourth, and then that became third after the qualifications. Um, Signs has had a few of those like stealth podiums where he doesn't actually stand on the podium, and then the results <laughs> change. Um, crucially, though, that means Ferrari are only twelve points behind Mercedes now. Whereas, if Hamilton had kept that second place, that gap would have been significantly yeah. bigger. So. Yeah, not I only think that, Ferrari... Hamilton's gap to Perez as well has been... Yeah, he saved yes. Perez a little bit, isn't, hasn't it? Very much so. Uh, Aston Martin, both side from the pit lane, um, they basically said they got the setup completely wrong, which is why their brakes were massively overheating in practice, um, and then both cars out in Q1. So they pretty much just made as many changes as they could get away with and pit lane started, uh, including Alonso going back to the old spec car because they had a lot of upgrades for comparison purposes. Um, and they had a good Grand Prix. Like they were really motoring up through the field. Um, yeah. But Alonso, I think it was a rear suspension issue from riding the bumps a bit too hard on Alonso's car. Um, but yeah, they were on for a double points finish from the pit lane, which was a good performance. Just a shame about um, that retirement. Yeah. But again, well done, Aston. from we say well done, but also from where they started the season. True. Yeah, the upgrades I, don't I seem to be like, bringing much of the performance back. No, that's true. But I think like a lot of, I think they're maybe saving a bit, bit of their powder for next year now. 
I think they've been pumping money into next year for a while now, haven't they? Yeah, I, I feel that way, yeah. Yeah, like they did bring upgrades this weekend, but I think they're very much the sort of we're testing things for next year kind of upgrades. Yeah. Which bodes well for next year because the way things yeah. are going, we're going to have, what, four or five teams? Like, hopefully. Hopefully at the sharp yeah. end. I feel like we said this about 12 months ago. <laughs> no, but it feels more like it. It feels more like it, it now, does. though, I think. It it does. Do, you, I get more that, more that sense now than I did 12 months ago. You know, like mm-hmm. this yeah. time, you know, this time last year, going into Mexico, Red Bull looked completely untouchable like no one was no one was going to go anywhere near and whereas right now i think red bull look yes to be fair red bull have not really developed towards the second half of the season, last latter stage of the season but they do look a bit more vulnerable than than they did this time last year yeah i would agree with that uh quick word on alpha terry um snow had a great race i thought i probably snowed his best race of the season i think um he started 11th, finished 10th, um, which then became 8th, and then also grabbed fastest lap um, <laughs> with a bit of an opportunistic pit stop towards the end. Um, yeah. Yeah, really solid race from Sonoda. Um, had to sort of fight for it, but did well to grab a few pretty vital points for them down in that fight at the bottom. Uh, Ricardo had a comparatively miserable time. Um, he picked up some floor damage really early on, tried to one stop, which didn't pay off, just tumbled. Pretty rough return for him. All in all, yeah, he was running on soft tires at one point as well. Yeah, well, he so he came in a few laps from the end to put softs on, got the fastest lap, and then they <laughs> brought Sonoda in, who then stole the fastest lap off Ricardo, which was a weird <laughs> no, was slap like, in the oh, face. That's a good idea. Why don't we do it again? Yeah, <laughs> maybe Ricardo's lap was like the fastest, but only just, and they were like, "No, we need more of a buffer than this." I mean, th- well, there's also the point that. When Ricardo is finishing where he is, the fastest lap is pointless. Of course, like, yeah, li- of course literally it pointless. So yes. it's yeah. it's a case, probably a case of, oh, why weren't we doing this with a car that's about yeah. to finish in the points instead? <laughs> Forgot about that. Um, Williams after the disqualifications, double points finish. Um, first point for Sergeant in F one at his home race. <laughs> well, he's he's got three home races, and one of them's yeah. more home than this one, but it gets still a home race. Um, yeah. A next door home, next door to home race. Yeah, <laughs> I would also say maybe Sergeant's best race of the season as well. He was pretty. He was seemed a lot closer to Albon at this track. He didn't really do anything particularly stupid, as far as I saw. Um, <laughs> he he needed this performance this weekend. I think um, it also. Yeah. They've also grown the gap to Alfa Romeo behind them to ten points now. So Williams looking pretty good to finish seventh um in the constructors now yeah i yeah. think it shows you what a boring it boring season it's been when the narrative switches to will logan sergeant at points <laughs> i know right i just i've sorry guys but i just have not got involved in that storyline very much at all i, <laughs> I mean I don't find it interesting what's not honest. particularly interesting on on that point though what a logan sergeant way to actually earn points for the first time yeah. is <laughs> yeah. his two cars ahead of him getting disqualified so he gets it by proxy yeah hey we, we take them we still default them. default, default. <laughs> um and then the other team to bring big upgrades was Haas, um which in free practice seemed to be like really doing the business they were right up there in practice and then it kind of all just went away again. Like <laughs> classic Haas, isn't it? Yeah. They only got one car into Q2, ended up starting from the pit lane after making a load of changes as well. Um, they've climbed back to 11th and 14th in the end, but a bit of a disappointment after all of the... They've been talking about the this upgrade for like months now, and it's finally turned up and it's sort of... Done nothing. Not helped all that much. Yeah. Done just nothing. Taking them from nowhere to slightly less nowhere. Maybe. Yeah, um, and then to finish on Austin, the sprint. Why, why are we doing this? I, I it was just awful. It took away valuable practice time for a lot of teams. The race was rubbish. It also kind of gave away the game as to what the pace was going to be like for teams during the Grand Prix. I, yeah. I'm going, to, I'm going to read you a quote. See if you can guess who this quote is from. I already know who this is going to be. Oh, you already know. I don't know if, if, if you've seen already, this time. I already agree with this person. It's very rare that I agree with this person, but on this, um, this is just <laughs> I do. 
I still think there's things that can be done to evolve the sprint race. I still think there's an element of tuning that needs to be done to the format. I think you've got to add a bit more jeopardy to it, whether you reverse the top 10 or something, then you've got to add enough points to make it worth the driver's while to really go for it. Do you want to hazard a guess who that might be, Tom? FIA president. Nope. That is mm. Christian Horner. Uh, well, that was my second. That was my second choice. To be fair, you I mean, when, I, when I was the man about who to say would that benefit least the least from, that. from those sort of changes to the sprint is advocating to them. Yeah. You know, you've just got a lemon of a format. Yeah, uh, I think it's a good. It's good that people in Formula One are now talking about reverse grid sprint races. I think. I, I, I bang on this drum a lot, but I think it should be reverse championship order grid mm-hmm. and probably maybe a few more points. Yeah, maybe top 10 get points. But um, maybe it's just the same number of points as a Grand Prix to make it worth their while. Well, the, but, uh, the, yeah, the rumblings, not working at the moment. The rumblings from a lot of journalists is that people within F1 are kind of accepting now that this format just isn't adding anything and they're looking at changes. Um, one change potentially being reverse grids, um, possibly making the sprint just a standalone Saturday championship. Um, Ugh, I hate that. No one will care just, about that. That'll make it no even worse. Gonna about. Get, oh, I'm going to win the sprint championship. Yippee. <laughs> Another idea apparently is bringing on a massive sponsor and having million dollar prizes for the winner of each sprint race. Good luck getting crypto.com Wait. to pay out a million quid every year. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, race. I don't think that's maybe they'll win a few Bitcoin or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, literally, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's just it's adding nothing. It's messing with um, Park Ferme too much. It's yeah, it's just, not a go. It hasn't been a go since they started doing it, and it's they'll they'll, they'll bend tried. over backwards and pretend that everyone loves it. But the reality, when you go on Twitter, when you go on social media, when you go anywhere around Formula One on the internet. 99% of fans are just like, meh, take it away. Pretty yeah. much. Um, but Formula 1 love it because they can make more money out of it. That's exactly, thing. yeah, it gets more eyes on the TV ultimately. Mm. Right, awards, drive of the day. I was Egon. thinking about this, and I think it's this is one of those drive of the days where the winner has to be the driver of the day because for Max Verstappen to have the mental fortitude to soak up that amount of pressure from... A, going through the field, and B, being caught towards the end with whatever issues he might have had in mm. the car. I think that's absolutely not only race win, but driver of the day worthy. I think he, I think he's killed it. I think he's absolutely nailed it. I mean, not just all that, but the fact that GP constantly kept talking to him in the braking zone. So. <laughs> yeah, apparently. <laughs> to put up with that, of, he deserves driver of the day. Yeah, I don't I believe, can't think of a mistake he made the whole thing, race either. <laughs> Well, other than outbreaking him. himself into whatever turn it was, where he would have pushed Leclerc wide had Leclerc not outbreaked. Yeah, him. there was that that overtaking, but he's like, it's not like he ever, even with his braking issues, didn't really see him locking up or missing apexes or anything. Um, hmm. I think equally Hamilton, I think was kind of at his best. I think he extracted yeah. the maximum out of that. He was yeah. the team that let him down there, really. Yeah. Um, and you could probably say the same about Norris. I think Norris probably extracted the maximum out of the, what he was given that race as well. Shall we call it a dead heat between the top three? I mean, we could. That feels a little bit boring. Um, uh, I'm going for Stappen then. I feel like Alonso would have been in the conversation had he finished the race because, I mean, even Stroll, like the way those two came through the field was pretty damn good. Didn't see much of that. <laughs> Didn't see a lot of it, but <laughs> impressed. Um, I thought Sonoda had a good race as well. But I feel like Stop adding not, more Sonoda's names to the driver list. Driver of the day, Sonoda is not driver of the day. Chris. Stop <laughs> adding <laughs> names to the list and just pick one, Chris. Um, I think Stu's convinced me, actually. I can go over Stappen. That makes my choice redundant then, so that's fine. What were you going to say, Tom? Mine was Norris, but that's just been Poster- a fanboy. Posterity. Fan- fanboyism. <laughs> Cool, for seven it is. Um, what about move of the day? I'm struggling to remember many, to be honest. Um, mm. Yeah. The two that stood out to me, Verstappen's pass on Norris for the lead, as much as Norris didn't defend it that much, it was very much 
the latest of late breaking got to the apex just about kept it in the track limits like that was a, a solid overtake yeah. from a from pretty far back as well yeah yeah i liked that one i think we, you know i think we might be double ver here for this uh drive of the day move of the day the other one was hamilton getting norris at turn one where norris made a pretty late defend to the inside so hamilton yeah. just yeah. swung it out wide and did a massive switch back i think the only thing that puts that one lower on the list for me is the fact that Norris kind of did that one to himself. Like when he went that that narrow, that over shallow on the corner, him. yeah, and over defended, he was always going a bit bit wide. He sort of he left the exit of the corner to Hamilton essentially. So it was still a good move, but I think the other one's better. Well, yeah. I think Hamilton did well not to go into the back of him. <laughs> well, yeah, the, yeah, because <laughs> it was pretty, it was right on the limit. I think of of a uh, of moving in the braking zone really because it was it was moving as he hit the brakes you know like it's like braking and turning at the same time and I, I i'm not sure i as much as i love lando norris i think that kind of defense is just too dangerous for me i don't like it it's not you don't want to see mm-hmm. that kind of defense where the driver has suddenly got to change their own direction under braking mm-hmm. and it causes accidents it's silly so in terms of an overtake i think uh, well in terms of a move avoiding a collision, I think, is a bit of a move to to uh, to reward there, but I think still, yeah, the, the Verstappen's move on Norris, I think, is the is the better one. Cool, I'll go with that. Uh, and then final one. Honestly, what the f- are we doing here? Um, what? There's a few pretty silly ones on this. <laughs> um, <laughs> she was obviously just read one of them, and for the first time. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> Between the sprint and the Grand Prix, um, at the exit of the penultimate corner, someone just came along with a bucket of white paint and just made the line thicker to change the edge of the track limits because there were quite a few track limit violations at that penultimate (laughs) corner in qualifying and the sprint. And they just painted the line wider onto the kerb to give them a bit more wiggle room. But they didn't seem to tell anyone. So it was like during the race, I think it was, yeah, I think it was during the race. Martin Bundle was suddenly like, Zimir, is that line thicker? Like, have, mm. they, have they made the mm. track limits a bit wider there? But they didn't tell any media at all. So everyone just kind of was working it out on the fly, which was very bizarre. How is How weird is that as well, that two races in a row, we've basically had them go, these track limits yeah. aren't quite what we want. Let's just paint, paint a bit more. We'll just change the yeah, track. Though we'll just go out we'll with a bucket of paint. That's two races in a row. Yeah. As though we've come to the wrong racetrack and this isn't quite the racetrack we wanted, so we'll just yeah. make the very racetrack strange. slightly different. Like, it's so stupid. Ugh, I hate it. Um, just as a, I mean, we're not going to give it this, but just as this feels like a good point to bring it up, the sort of discussion that started around drivers Plus. now basically overtaking people off the track getting yeah. a five second penalty but knowing that they'll be able to drive five seconds up the road so that's the russell scenario it. mainly isn't it that was the main culprit for this I russell think. was the biggest culprit of this um yeah. was that during the sprint wasn't it yeah yes yeah an album got away with one either in the sprint or the grand prix as well and there were at least a couple more yeah verstappen got away with one during sprint qualifying as well he he, he ran wide and just kept his lap time and got through <laughs> sq2 did he? Yeah, I'm sure he did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I, well, I, I know I, were... I I was watching it mute because I was watching the rugby at the same time, but um, it looked very much like. I mean, they might have what reviewed it and deemed it not going wide, but it looked yeah, pop. very wide Possibly. to me. So yeah, who knows? Um, a couple more that really made me laugh. Um, when everyone turned up to the track on Thursday there was a big banner thing at the back of the paddock with all the drivers on and they put Drogovic on it instead of Stroll. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly what? someone had just got all the pictures from pre-season testing or something. <laughs> I mean, that that's funny for me. That I've not seen that. That can have it, yeah, in my opinion. That's so dumb. Um, <laughs> my favourite on this list is the fact that... Um, so this was Leclerc, <laughs> Russell and Norris's 100th race. <laughs> So Russell and Norris both had a nice commemorative special helmet for it. Leclerc turned up with an NFL-themed helmet because he's raced in America, and then someone reminded him it was his 100th race, and he was like, oh, I forgot. I guess I'll just have an NFL helmet for the 100th race. <laughs> yeah. Leclerc just ain't care. <laughs> yeah. Um, the chat's also saying, um, 
Oh yeah, sorry, hundredth race for Ferrari, not his hundredth race overall. Yeah. Oh so, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Meh, meh, um, yeah, that's that's less significant. Then. Chat's <laughs> also saying uh, the helicopter getting shot with fireworks at the end of the race. Have you seen this? No. No, I didn't. I the mean, I saw the fireworks, like, but I didn't notice the helicopter. The helicopter was like hovering over the start finish line, and then as Verstappen crossed the line, they set off all the fireworks, I saw and that. the helicopter had to like rapidly get out of the way. <laughs> He was basically getting shot with fireworks. <laughs> oh my god! Like, yeah, that is so sketchy. <laughs> yep. So take your pick. I mean, um, Tom laughed the most at the I mean, Drogovic thing. I, I love having Drogovic on the back. Like, if that's not an <laughs> omen, I don't know what it is. It's just like, welcome to your garage, Philip Lance. <laughs> like, <laughs> wait, you're still here? <laughs> oh, that's Jeez, funny. Crazy. Okay, Stu, any complaints or? Should we go with that? No complaints from me. That's a nice <laughs> design yeah. led gaff yeah. that I've always got a lot of time for. <laughs> right. At least Tom. it's not kerning for a change, although I'm sure the kerning <laughs> on the piece was dreadful. Yes. Predictions, Prince. yes. Yeah, yes. I'm going to be as quick as possible with this this week yeah, just because we've obviously free. had a long one. So, not much to report for us. I will quickly, quickly clear up any questions we might have. So, the way it always works with this is. It's the number of finishers at the flag, regardless of disqualifications. That's how that rules always works. So it's 17 finishers that gets you the point this weekend. Um, and then Bottas's finishing position is the final finishing position. I know those rules kind of counter each other, but that's how we've always done it. So that's how we continue to do it. So Bottas's position is 12th. So that will earn you the points there. In terms of scores, Oli Masterson, Masterson on that note got four out of five, only getting... Leclerc pull wrong, so I think he'd gone with Verstappen. Uh, no, yeah, I think he'd gone with Verstappen, and it was Leclerc. But that's that. Uh, in terms of the standings, that leaves effortlessly at the top on forty point five points. Uh, Kirsty Bradshaw is on thirty eight point five, and so is uh, Dagan Deschamps also on thirty eight point five. So that's very close at the top for the top three. Uh, if you want to find out any more about the results or check out any of the fantasy leagues, head to the dot com. All the standings are on there, all the results are on there, and links to the Fantasy Leagues are on there as well. Well, news? Yeah. I'm inbox? Very quick news? news? Inbox? So in. um, <laughs> Go. We definitely have to mention F1 Academy that had their final uh, yes. round at uh, as a support race to F1. Um, the first time it's been televised live as well, which was very nice. Um, and hats off to like F1 TV and Sky who gave it like, a proper show they didn't just kind of stick it on the schedule with the commentaries like they did a proper show around it um a couple of great races actually uh marta garcia won the title with a couple of races to spare um i didn't realize they have the formula two and three rule where if you're champion you can't return next year um but f1 academy have said they're going to kind of give her lots of support to go and find something new probably some kind of formula regional thing there's also rumblings of a few f1 teams might be backing her which is uh which is very cool. Well, on, on that note, W Series was going to have the same rule, was it not? And then they changed it after the first season when they realised that they wanted um, Jamie Chadwick back. I'm sure that, oh, I'm really? sure that, that got changed after mm, that the fact. That sounds vaguely familiar, actually. Yeah. Just um, on a side note. Yeah. Um, also, you might remember next year, um, every F1 team is going to have a car in F1 Academy as a through a kind of sponsorship deal, basically. Um, they're not going to be running cars. They're still going to be run by like the feeder series teams, but they're going to be sort of liveried up as F1 cars. Um, uh, McLaren have been the first team to kind of announce that their driver is going to be uh, Bianca Bustamante, but they've actually gone a step further and put her in their driver development program, which is not, sort of mandated by the rules like it's a, the rules are just kind of a sponsorship thing but they've actually gone one step further and put her as part of the drive academy which uh which is very yeah, cool good. um she's a driver with a lot of promise so yeah cool to see that um and another interesting bit of news we've had in the last couple of days uh mercedes junior driver andrea kimmy antonelli who everyone apparently just calls kimmy because it's a cool name when you're a racing driver um <laughs> so he's mercedes 17 year old italian junior driver um they are jumping him from Formula Regional straight to Formula 2. Such is the hype around this kid. So um, no Formula 3, straight to Formula can, 2. No Formula 3. Can, straight I, can I just point out, this is an Italian with a middle name of Kimi who's mm -hmm. 17 years old. We all know where that comes from. <laughs> Racing for Mercedes. 
<laughs> yeah, but that, that makes redundant. The fact that his middle name is Kimmy and he's he's like he was born what a year or two after Kimmy won the last world title for Ferrari. Yeah. <laughs> like some Italian parents have got some passion for the team at least. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, yeah. But he, so this year he won Formula Regional Europe and Asia titles. He's won a lot. Attempt. He's won a lot this year. Year before he won Italian, German F4, and the Motorsport Games F4 all in one year. So yeah, he's going straight to F two. He's going to be Ollie Behrman's teammate probably at Prima. Um, it's he like if, no if you're going to watch, if you're going to watch one driver in feeder series, like yeah, yeah. keep an eye on him. He is very much like the next yeah. big thing. But the battle with him and Ollie Behrman next season will be very interesting yes, to watch. Yes, very, very good. interesting. Legit Looking forward to that. And, well. and Prima is obviously a very good team as well in terms of that yeah. junior formula, in terms yeah. of what they get out of the drivers and, and helping them to thrive. So. Yeah, should be a very good competition between them next year. Yeah. Right. Should we dive into Mexico? Yeah, do some quick storylines. Quick storylines. Do you want to do three? Um, okay, first one. How will the running order change on a track with very different characteristics and altitude? Yes, Mexico is very, very high up. Um, it's going to be interesting, isn't it, to see, to see how this affects the running order, especially with teams appearing to have closed up somewhat i'm mm. not 100 percent sure they're going to be that close i think red bull might have the edge once more but if they don't it will be close between everyone so i think this yeah. track's definitely going to suit the red bull more than certainly more than austin did but you said all the rest <laughs> well yeah that's true <laughs> except singapore <laughs> yeah uh, to be fair, I said Austin would be really good for Red Bull and then it was too bumpy for them. But I think if yeah. it wasn't so bumpy, it, it is a Red Bull track, but it's just too bumpy. Yeah. Uh, it's not going to resurface in Cota again for like the second time in three years or something. Yeah. It's crazy. There's something about like the the ground underneath it that makes it's it more prone It's on a swamp. It, yeah, it's <laughs> just built on... I'll do it. Yeah, yeah, it's trash land. Yeah, anyway... Um, next one, will Mercedes be able to extract performance from a new floor without having the same plank issues? I've got a feeling they might. I'd say so. I think I think it is just it's a lack of being able to test with it properly due to the shortened weekend in terms of testing time and a bumpy circuit. Those those two factors have just sort of generated a perfect storm in them not being able to get the best out of that setup. Mm -hmm. So which is what I was alluding to earlier with I don't think the floor is the problem and I don't think the problem's caused by the floor. Like it's they are separate and I think if they can get a normal practice weekend, a practice regime out of it, then they'll be fine. Yeah, I think I think yeah. so too. And if it was uh, only Mercedes that had the problems this week last weekend, yeah. I'd be more worried. But the fact that Ferrari had the same thing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. On a car that it. was wasn't even updated for this race. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Same car has been for yeah. races and races. Um, next one is can Perez improve his form at his home race they say the home crowd is worth at least a tenth um, he needs more than Perez that Perez is going to need more than that I think, but <laughs> <laughs> it'll be I mean it, look it's always nice to see someone do well on their home race especially when they're at the sharp end so yeah let's hope he can take the fight to uh, to Verstappen spoiler yeah, alert he probably won't I think yeah. I think he'll be back on the podium this weekend that would be my guess do you think so I think so where was he this weekend? He was fifth, wasn't he? And then fourth after the disqualifications. Yeah. I mean, he's closer. Uh, he was pretty anonymous that. throughout the race, wasn't he? Really, very he anonymous. Really, no one really paid much attention. I suppose yeah. when there's so much going on at the front, you you don't really need to worry about Perez down in sixth or whatever it was. Um, that's it. <laughs> that's it for predictions. Uh, for, sorry for storylines this week. Should we do some pred predictions? Yeah, let's, let's quickly let's. rattle through our <laughs> predictions. So uh, fastest in. Q3. Chris, where are you going with this one? Verstappen. Stu? Verstappen. And me? Verstappen. Winner? Verstappen. Chris? Verstappen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's one of the Verstappen show. It's, it's happening. It's happening. First DNF. Verstappen. That was easy. No. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> hmm. First DNF. Oh. You could be really cruel and say Perez as he crumbles. Tom probably is going to. <laughs> I can see on his face that he's going to. Uh, I'm going to go with... Oh, it's going to be like an Alpine or something, isn't it? Let's go Gasly. I was also thinking Alpine. So he's going to go, I can. I'll say the other one. 
I'll go walk on. Yeah. Okay, I'm not going to say Perez because as much as that's my MO usually, I don't think that's what will <laughs> happen. Um, so I'm going to go with uh, one of the Hasses. I'm going to say Hulkenberg for this one. Uh, number of finishes. I'll go first because I've not gone first on any of them. I'm going to say 16 this weekend. I don't know why, but I feel like less finished than I thought last week. This weekend just gone near the end of the season. I'm going to say the same. A bit less than I'd normally think. Thin air, overheating. Mm. I'm going to go um, 17. 17. And I was going to go 18, so that works out oh, perfectly. Yeah. That works out lovely. Sorry, Chris, I jumped in on you a little bit there, didn't I? No, <laughs> absolutely fine. Who is our random driver this weekend, Chris? We've only got two left, so I'm going to do a coin flip. And it is Daniel Ricardo. Ouchies. This one's 17. difficult. 17. Very difficult. Ooh, finishing but last on the road for Stu. Ooh. Um, I might put him down in one of my DNFs, you know. I'm also going to go 17th and have him as one of my DNFs. I'm doing it. I'll have him oh, in... I've got a little more faith. I'll have him in 14th. 14th. There we go. Uh, if you want to get involved with this and submit your own predictions, head to backofthegrid.com where you can submit yours. They'll be open after the podcast has gone out. Uh, so when you're listening to this, and uh, always do it because if you get five out of five any race weekend, there's a prize for you. So be sure to enter. Should we do it in box? Let's. Yeah, let's rattle through this. Uh, keep me saying now. Um, I'm going to nominate you to go first, Gene. <laughs> okay. Um, Daft Kilowog says, why was Stroll allowed to be rolled back into the pit lane after incorrectly lining up and why wasn't he penalised for this as we saw with Hulk earlier this season? I think he was penalised, wasn't he? He was not, no. Um, yeah. So he, Stroll did the reconnaissance laps and went to the grid rather than back into the pit lane to do his pit lane start. So the team basically put the car on trolleys and rolled it back into the pit lane. And the th- I read some first earlier. The FIA basically said, we've looked through the rules and as much as what you did is bad and please don't do it again, there's not actually explicitly a rule that you've broken by doing that. So we can't penalise you. Weird. So well, what exactly Hulkenberg it- got penalised for early this year, I'm not certain. But it was, wasn't was- Hulk's that he was in the wrong grid slot because of somebody moving. Is that not what that was? Yeah, which, he, which thought, is a rule. Yeah, he did. That is a rule, and he did. He moved and, forward by one. Into yeah, he moved into an empty grid slot by mistake when he shouldn't have, if I remember rightly. I mean, I would argue that Stroll was in the wrong grid slot in that he was in a grid <laughs> On slot. On the grid, <laughs> yeah. But he didn't start the race there, though. That's I think, yeah, do, I guess do you know what I mean? That, that's the difference, and I think that's maybe why he's got away with it. But yeah, yeah. 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 Next one. Next, from Clarence90. Hey, man, Lando is doing lift and coast in turn 12 at the start of the race. I was hoping you could shed some light on possible reasons for this. Is it about cooling, protecting the floor with the heavy fuel load, saving fuel, something else? Saving everything. Saving tyres, saving <laughs> fuel. Yeah, a saving bit of all of the above, isn't all it? All of the above, basically. Yeah. 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 I don't know why they wouldn't... I mean, fuel's a weird one. That, that, that early in the race, you wouldn't expect to be sort of you know burning lifting and coasting that early in the race because you're running out of fuel would be very strange because you want to unless they under fueled him by accident maybe yeah or maybe maybe look at previous races they're expecting an early safety car and didn't get one so he yeah. had to get something yeah. earlier on I'd more likely i think temperatures break temperatures maybe if the staff yeah it was yeah break, it was hot again, wasn't it? Temps, it was I think. like yeah. 30 plus in the air i think so it's probably cooling brakes. So it's more cooling than anything, I imagine. Yeah, that would make sense as well because the the weight of all the fuel in the car would put a lot more work into the brakes as well. So yeah, mm-hmm. that for me is the most likely reason why you'd be lifting and coasting that early in a race. But you know, I'm not an F1 driver or an engineer, so I'm just <laughs> I'm just a muppet who makes podcasts every week. So I don't know. <laughs> we're close though. We're somewhere near. <laughs> I think I we're think. somewhere. There's, in there, there's the correct answer somewhere. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> Um, Oscar Falden says, why do Ferrari try a one-stop when it's common knowledge that the red car eats tyres faster than floorboards? <laughs> I'm not exactly... 
sure what that phrasing means. It means but... like the plank. It means it's the, the plank, plank on, the on the floor. Plank. Yeah, yeah. Oh, right. Okay, I see. I see. Uh, um, because Ferrari, I mean... I mean... Literally, you took the words out of my mouth. Because yeah, yeah. It was because Ferrari. No it's other team would do. just a poor decision by Ferrari. That's yeah. it. The Ferrari strategy computer is broken. Yeah. Uh, last one is from Andrea Hanna, and it says... It's not talked about with all the chaos. Do you think that someone was at fault for Piastri Ocon incident? Looking forward to your mm. show as always. Thank you, um, Andrea. Yeah, um, Ocon was totally Ocon, at fault. Probably, yeah. If there is he any drove fault. In, yeah. Straight up drove into him. I'm trying, to re- I'm trying to remember the scenario because it was, it was a little bit of a cut across Piastri, wasn't it? Like, no, Piastri's just out wide on the left and, and Ocon just ran wide into him. That's what I mean. Like He's cut across the front of him. That's what I'm getting at. Like... Ocon yeah. basically took the racing line as if there wasn't a car already yeah. on it, yeah. essentially. Because Piastri had gone around the outside of Ocon, that's what had happened mm. before, because it was really early into the race. Yeah, I honestly just don't... I don't even think Ocon was looking. Like, look no, at, watching looking, it now, he... Ocon's looking to his right, and so if he's looking in his mirrors or looking to the, for the next apex, and he's looking right and drifting left and just drove into him. So, yeah, yeah, mm. very yeah. much Ocon's fault. Unfortunate. Unfortunate racing incident. It's early, early, early race racing incident. Probably. Yeah, say. probably. It was like turn two, wasn't it? It was in the S's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And that is about it this week. Um, lots packed in again. Busy weekend. Um, we'll be back in a week's time to review the Mexican Grand Prix, the second of this triple header that we find ourselves in. Um, if you want to get in touch with us between now and then, as ever, you can go to Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all of those things, and you can find us. Um, you can also go to backthegrid.com and fill in the contact us form, and you can also find all of the details of the Predictions League and Fantasy League and all of that stuff there. If you want to get involved with our Discord, you can go to patreon.com slash backofthegrid, and you can find all the details of that there. Um, Wherever you happen to be watching or listening, please do like, share, subscribe, all of those things. It is extremely helpful for us. And I think that is it. So thank you once again for listening. And we'll be back next week. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.